Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. This is Zach Mayfield, an editor I have adored for years. Zach came on the show today and we nerded out about his editing career, going all the way back to the Fuji Juice days, to his time as an editor for Matt Diavella, which is crazy by the way, all the way back to today with his current strategy, his Dr. Disrespect video, and where he wants to go creatively, both for stories and editing today. This conversation was full of good laughs, dad hats, but most importantly, great editing. I absolutely cannot wait for you guys to hear this one, so let's dive right in. You gotta marry one, you gotta F one, you gotta kill one. Da Vinci, Final Cut, Premiere, baby. Mm, easy, dude. Right off the bat, I'm killing Final Cut. And I've, I've been in relationships with all three of these, by the way, so after that, I'm killing Final Cut. I'd marry DaVinci Resolve for sure. Very reliable, loyal to me. And I'd probably have a one night stand with Premiere again because it's been a while. Because <laughs> it's it's been a minute. It's been a hot minute. Forgetting what it was like, you know? Totally. I have opinions and thoughts on that for sure. <laughs> I still to this day have never touched Premiere. I'm still just like Final really? Cut DaVinci. That's rare, I feel like. It's usually like Premiere and then go into DaVinci. So that's that's very rare. I'm I'm curious about your your time with that. So we'll have to get into that too. Before you dive into an edit, are you a music first guy or music is your editing or how do you usually tackle music? What's your thoughts there? Yeah. So when I start an edit, I usually try to gather everything I can in the beginning stages, like organization stage. I'm big. I'm huge on like structure, folders, organization, but with music specifically, I wait until the first rough cut is done. Cause that kind of gives me an idea of like the flow and the vibe or whatever I want to go for. So I do wait on music. Favorite editing snack, you know, what got to sit down, get, fill the tummy. What, what's your go-to? Oh my gosh. Editing snack. That's such a good question. I feel like nuts is a safe choice unless they're super dusty. Cause then they're getting in your keyboard and stuff. So maybe some just like kind of plain old almonds, you know, cause they're not going to get me super chunky, but they'll satisfy me enough to get me through the eight hour edit or whatever it is. Yes. I've had this conversation like three times now, which is why this question keeps coming back. But like editing snacks are a dance, a dance with death. Cause you can't get crusties, right? Like <laughs> gre grease, greasy keyboards are the worst Thing. Your shortcuts and your fingers are just kind of slipping and sliding off. You're like, dude, I can't be efficient right now. That's is a good answer. I, I I would agree with that one. I, again, like there's the super dusty, salty ones. So just got to be careful with those bad boys. But Yeah, stay away from the dusters for sure. Coffee or tea? Mm, I'm a coffee boy. I'm a coffeeholic, dude. I'm trying to limit myself to two cups a day because, you know, I'm, I'm almost a dad and I'm starting to get jittery if I have too much, but I like coffee. Keeps me, keeps me like flowing too, getting all my waste out, you know? <laughs> Can't start the day without it. Otherwise it's not happening. Just take a single <laughs> sip and you're good. Lock and load. <laughs> Did you have handles in my bathroom that I hold on to and just fire it off? Dude, that's amazing. Yeah. And I, I feel that on the, uh, oh my God, I'm tearing up a little. Um, <laughs> I'm feeling that on the caffeine lately i'm like man i need to i need to pump the brakes because it's like it's funny because i keep reading all these studies about people that are like oh it like numbs your body to it so it stops working and i don't i don't feel that like if i have more than two cups like i almost like start getting sick these days like it's just like really like messing me up so yeah i'm like i i, I hate tea though so I'm like, maybe I just need to start drinking decaf or something. I don't know. Because I love like, warm beverage while editing pff, does not get better than it that. It just gets the the aroma, I feel like, just gets the creative juices flowing. You got to balance it with a little bit of hydration too. Just a smidge of water, you know, so you don't get too too dry. Keeping with the bathroom theme, when you chug water, it forces you to get up and pee, which I like. Because otherwise I'd sit there for six hours straight. <laughs> So <laughs> is there a YouTuber right now that you do not miss like notification hits your phone and like you, you drop everything to watch? Who is that? Mm, it is Nakey Jakey and has been for multiple years at this point. Have you heard of Nakey Jakey? Jake? I have not. What? I have not heard of Nakey Jakey. Dude. Oh my gosh. If you want to talk about master editing, you have to watch Nakey Jakey. He does like game not documentaries, but like really deep dive video game essays, but he films in front of a green screen sitting on a yoga ball and like his editing will make you weep, dude. He's so good. So good. Which everything you just said makes me think if you, if he's been your favorite for years, like all of that sounds like Zach Mayfield inspiration right there. Like, I love that you were just like green screen, beach ball editing. I was like, yep. Okay. 
that's that's Zach. Yeah, he's a <laughs> he's a huge inspiration to me. And actually, like I found out after I became a fan of him, I found out that he grew up like an hour away from where I grew up as a kid. And he's like, we're almost the same age too. I'm like, dude, I could have run into him as a kid, but. Yeah, you got to check him out, man. His editing is incredible. It's really funny. Plus, his name is great. <laughs> as you, as an editor, you watch one of his videos and you just appreciate it because the amount of keyframes this man has to do to pull off his edits is unbelievable. It's crazy. Keyframe dedication boys are like a new level. Dude, yeah, we need to like start a clothing brand that's like the keyframe fam or something. <laughs> It's just yeah. like the keyframe little logo on the chest. Keyframe emotional support team. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Um, who's? I'm curious though. Like, who's your YouTuber? Like, that you will not miss, or one or two? Again, it changes all the time. Like back in the day, it was like Pete, right, and Casey. Um, nowadays, like, I do not miss a Gox video, like under any circumstance. I don't know if you've ever watched him. I think I've heard that name, but I don't think I've ever watched that. Channel. he's dude he's nuts he's absolutely nuts and you'll be sitting there going like i don't give a shit about painting and i can't stop watching this video <laughs> that's how you know they're like a master creator and his thumbnails and titles are incredible too that's so cool and now i mean let's let's just get nerdy let's just get nitty gritty i mean i i i want to i kind of want to talk about the fuji juice oh, era but oh my gosh <laughs> i literally forgot about that until you said it oh my gosh that comes back to get me every once in a while like whoa i forgot about that i'm so curious like what you like have seen from my old stuff because i feel like that was a different human being at this point if i see my old videos i'm like that wasn't me that was some other guy that had the channel it's a crazy era because i'm thinking back to like yeah, like the GH5 days, the XT4, Fuji Juice days, the Cranon days, you know, like like all the way back then. And then I think it was, if I'm, I'm trying to remember the timeline and maybe refresh me and the audience on it, but then there was like, it was kind of Kino Tika era too, right? Yeah, wow, you really know your stuff. Because I feel like my journey has just been like, just like a skid mark on a piece of underwear, dude. It's been just all over. The it's just been insane. It's been weird. Um, but yeah, the... That I think you have the order correct, actually. I think, yeah, there was like that old era of me just figuring crap out. Also, I wanted to talk to you about musician stuff because I saw a Bugera amp head in one of your videos. I was like, oh, this guy's a guitar player. Are you a guitar player? Yeah, dude. I, uh, not anymore. I, I suck cheeks these days, but <laughs> <laughs> I did garage band. I got a Mac. Like, I think that is where the love for editing came from. And I didn't realize that until... I don't know, eight months, six months ago. And I was like, oh, that's why I like editing because I used to just sit and spend hours doing all the tracks with the music and stuff. Um, you would just find ways to make things work too, I'm guessing. Cause like, dude, I was doing the same thing as you. I had this crappy mixer in my school, like Mac, like the original white one, the laptop. And I would like use the, the freaking webcam camera or the microphone to record my guitar amp. So like, it sounded so bad, but I was like anything to make this work. And then you're trying to EQ and edit. I think you just helped me realize that's where my love of editing probably came from as well. I didn't even put those two together. That's crazy. I think so. I think I genuinely think that people with musical backgrounds and editing, like it doesn't, it at surface level, it feels hyper related, but like so different that you kind of write it off. But when you really think about it, like they are the same genre, the same thing. Like it is, it's just one has video on top of it, but also, and you probably did this too, like making music videos back in the day, like it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> I think being a musician can actually like really influence your editing in a good way too. Cause you learn like flow and pacing when not to use sound and when to use it. It's really easy to like overdo stuff. So I think you learn that balance and music helps basically. So I toured in a metal band for five years and that was like my huge dream was to become like a professional musician. And I, I had been working toward that since I was like nine years old, I was obsessed with music and guitar. Um, so I just used YouTube as a way to like document my journey. So that was really the big first chapter was like, I was making music going on tours and then I was like, I'll start documenting this. And then through that, I kind of fell into like testing out some camera gear on my channel. And I like, I made like a gimbal video that got like 10,000 views or something. And I was getting all these comments and I was like, no, I don't want people to see this. I don't want, and like people were being mean to me. And I was like, I don't know how to handle this. This is so freaking scary. Um, but through that, I was like, oh, like maybe 
maybe I do like this. And then like everybody else on YouTube, I discovered Casey Neistat and I was like, all right, we're going to, we're going to try this YouTube thing. So I've literally been trying since like 2016, <laughs> something like that. Just trying to figure out what the heck this platform is all about. Dude, totally. And it's changed so much because I mean, I remember that like the 2016 era I was, yeah, I was in college and like, you just wake up and watch a Casey video. And like, I feel like our whole generation sort of like grew up with that as an inspiration. And nowadays, I mean, the landscape is so different. Like you can't make a Casey vlog, dude. I mean, it feels like maybe it's kind of coming back. And there's a couple of people I'd love to talk to this year, like, uh, Colt Kerwin and life Ariza that are like popping off yep. right now. Cause they're doing very, um, just kind of more. 2016 era style. I was going to say, this is a really random editing tidbit, but I actually have gotten the pleasure of editing and grading some of uh, Life of Riza's footage because for a little bit when I was editing for Matt Diavella, she was like a contractor for him, just like shooting some B-roll scenes. And so I got to like edit her footage and it was always so beautiful. You worked with Matt? Oh my God, that's crazy. Because has she, I don't think she's talked about that. Maybe she has. I have not seen a video where she's talked about it. I think it was just like one-off like contract gigs um, that Matt would ask her to do. Um, but yeah, her footage is always glorious. I was like, this is such a pleasure to grade. Yeah, she's like a composition master. Dang, that's super cool. Okay, so music era and then gimbal video pops off and then you kind of start to think you like it. And then that kicks off just like the first Zach Mayfield era with camera review stuff and xt4 basically i think so yeah that there was like a period where i was doing like i was trying to balance my touring musician life because i was gone like six months out of the year for those years so i was like making tour vlogs which was fun but then like when i was home i was like doing freelance so working on that and like trying to make camera videos so honestly there was like a lot of years where i was just like trying stuff and like figuring out my style and, and my videos are so bad. The audio sucks. The color looks terrible. And like, I didn't even think about like music selection. I would just be like, lo-fi download, put it in the video. It's like, everything has like changed and grown since then. But yeah, that was the first era. And then it kind of got into like, when I got the X-T4, then I started just like, cause I like sold my big black magic cinema camera and my GH5 for this tiny little Fuji. And I was like, I'm just going to try this thing. And there was just, a large community of people that were interested in it as well. So that's where my like first like growth spurt happened on YouTube was the, the XT4 Fuji juice days. And that was so fun. We started a cult basically. I think that that era of editing is some of my fondest memories of your stuff, which again, it's cool to see what you're doing now, which is not, I mean, by all, <laughs> by all objective metrics, like so much better, <laughs> but I loved, I loved the Fuji era because, and again, I've got all these notes of just like the, the little things you would do. And again, I think it was in this era with just like the dorky green screen stuff, all kinds of funny wee, wee music. <laughs> My, I like, I, I'm, and again, I kind of do some of this too. I feel like it's all sort of the same kind of stuff that inspires me, but just the, the freaking punch in on the lips with the distorted audio, you know, like those types of effects I love. And I want to hear like where that came from and what got you into that stuff. Cause I, I, I ate that up. <laughs> That's so cool to hear. And honestly, we can get into this a little bit later. Like when we talk about the Matt Diavella era, but like, I feel like I've actually kind of lost a little bit of that. And I, I like, I'm trying to figure out how to re-implement some of those old tactics without it being forced, I guess, because I think working for Matt like refined me so much. We'll get into it. But like all that to say, I really appreciate that you appreciate those goofy edits because that was just like it was kind of me just like like throwing up a middle finger to YouTube in a way and to our our space a little bit, because at that point in the filmmaking camera photography space, like. I feel like there's so many people like taking themselves really seriously and that's just not me. Like, and it seems like that's not you as well. It's just like, I wanted to be myself, but still talk about these topics. So I was like, I'm just going to make it fun. And like, if people hate it, that's fine. If people like it, great. But the Fuji videos, like that's where I really leaned into that. And I was like, oh, there are people that like this. So I'm like, I started to find a community and it was really wholesome and, and exciting. But yeah, I just, I love those stupid goofy edits and i think premiere pro was strangely like better for that kind of stuff i don't know like their keyframing and stuff felt like really snappy in premiere for whatever reason 
And I got a lot of inspiration from like Nakey Jakey's editing and Curtis Connor. I don't know if you've heard of Curtis. I have. Holy crap, dude. I want to meet him so bad. His editing is like such an inspiration to me. He's a freaking ding dong and I love his edits so much. Yeah, he's a legend and I actually only discovered him recently because he was on Colin and Samir's show. So I actually am pretty new to him, but everything I've seen, I'm like, this guy's a legend. So do you know if he uses Premiere then or does he... I'm trying to remember if he said... I could find out though because my buddy Dave makes his thumbnails now. So we... So I might, I might have to do like a Black Ops mission and find out what he's editing on. But I know he does all the editing himself for his main channel, which mad respect to that. Tip of the old cap there, my man. <laughs> it's also like the Casey Neistat method of like, that's his voice and that's where he finds the story. So I just think it's, I mean, I want to edit my stuff as probably forever just because I love it. It's super fun. Yeah, I know. Yeah, for the first time I had like, I think I had four videos stacked up this week and I was like, man... I'd love to hire someone, but I like that is against everything in my being. Like, like I'm the editing guy, like, like maybe one day, but like, I can't, I can't, I, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. <laughs> it's pretty easy, like to dream about scaling too early. Cause I've thought about it too, but logistically it's, it's so expensive and, but there is a way to like build your process out in a way where like you still get to put your voice on it, which is what we we did with Matt. So it was me, my buddy Spencer, we're both editors for Matt full time. And we built this system with Matt that was like freaking incredible. Cause like we were in three different countries, but remote editing together. And like, it was seamless, dude. It was so cool. So there's ways to do it where you still get to have your voice on it. Like hit me with more of that. What, what, I, I don't know. Maybe we need the backstory on how we got there, but I am so curious to hear and I thought it was just you. So if there was another editor, I can't wait to hear about the workflow with that. Because again, I've, I've edited for people and I've used various different ways of doing it just with what people prefer. And I mean, the, <laughs> the spectrum is vast in terms of like, hey, I'm just going to give you footage or like, hey, I have the X, Y, and Z that I prefer. And here's how we're going to do it. Do it this way. Right. I mean, it's everyone's got their own way of doing it and you hear somebody say like i'm gonna give you footage but it's like okay the word give could be divided into like 20 different tasks that you could do different ways so like for instance our setup was cool man and it took us a while to figure this out but because we did it like as a team and that was like part of my job in the beginning was like fig like figure out how to build this system with with spencer so basically what we did is matt would film and then upload to his Google Drive. And his Google Drive was like extremely organized. He was an inspiration to me on organization. But then we would use this app called Carbon Copy Cloner. And you can set it. So basically, Carbon Copy just like can like mirror hard drives. Like if you have one and you want the files to go to the other one the exact same, you can do that. Or you can set it up to like take files from a Google Drive folder and put them to a hard drive folder automatically like every morning. So we would use that to like download Matt's footage overnight because you can schedule the tasks. So in the morning, everything's just like on my local SSD from his Google Drive. Then I would edit it. At the end of the day, I would hit push on Carbon Copy and it would send all of my updates to Google Drive so that Matt had them. And like Spencer could do his edits because we were all just like pulling and pushing just using that one app through Google Drive. And it was seamless. Like we could edit in DaVinci Resolve with zero latency. It was insane. Because you because the files are just on your hard drive. So you guys were using DaVinci Resolve then. Yeah, we. So, oh, dude, yeah, that's actually we got it. Okay, can we rewind a little bit? Rewind, man. Let's. I mean, I I want to hear so much about this, but give me all the context you need. <laughs> okay, so yeah, there's that like Fuji XT4, Fuji Juice Cult era of my channel, and at that time I was also full time like hosting another YouTube channel called Kino Tika, which was like a really fun camera review channel that I inherited as from my friend as a full-time job. So that was sick. And so I was making videos on both. And then I posted a clip of like this old VHS video on my Instagram and Matt Diavella commented on it. And he was like, this is so cool. Like I used to use a Sony Handycam too. And I was like, what the, f what the heck? Like Matt Diavella's comment. I literally was like 2 AM. I'm like screaming in my room, like just wearing my underwear, just freaking out. So I was like, I have to come up with a plan to like, just talk to Matt. So I came up with this whole plan. I made this whole video to try to get him to see it. He sees the video and 
emails me and he's like, Hey man, would love to chat with you. And I was like, what the heck? So like, I, I like hop on a video call like this with Matt Diavella and like, I was nervous to talk to you, but like when I, when I saw Matt Diavella's face pop up, I just like crapped my pants basically. I was like, hello, sir. I like minimalism too. Yeah. It was uh, weird. Hi. It was so cool. Anyway, in that call, in that call, he's like, I loved your video. Like, it's really cool. I like what you're doing. He's like, would you be interested in full-time work, like editing for me? And I was like, jaw hit the floor. I was like, yes, please. Which that's really crazy because I mean, it was just off of like a, the Handycam video, which was just an Instagram video. So there was no like, there was no context there of I'm really good at editing. I mean, the work was there, but like, I don't know, like, had he seen your other stuff or like, how did that get, how did he even think that? <laughs> so there's one more puzzle piece. Basically, I had applied to edit for him like two years prior and forgotten about it because he like opened up this like little submission form. It was like, hey, I might be looking for editors and his channel wasn't like as huge back then. So I sent like a couple of like my wedding films and a YouTube video. And apparently that's when he learned about me was through that submission form and I had no idea. So he had already seen some other work of mine. Um, okay. okay. So basically like that, journey happened i ended up doing a, t a test project got hired and eventually like got into editing for him i was still in premiere and then a couple months into he was like zach spencer we're switching to final cut and i was like no i was like lord please save me i can't do this <laughs> had you had you used it before then I never touched it once so we hop into final cut and i edit some stuff in there, just like trying to learn it. So I try to learn it in two weeks and then we get on another call two weeks later and he's like, guys, Zach Spencer, we're switching to resolve. I was like, what dude? I was like, are you serious? bro? I just spent two weeks learning final cut. I was like, it was really funny. I wasn't that mad, but it was like really funny. Oh, totally. It's so good. Just, just back forth. Like Michael Scott, like snip, snap, snip, snap, snip, snap. Snip. You know, the effect of two NLEs takes on a man. The reason we switched to Resolve was just mostly the collaborative efforts, like the, the collaborative, like um, remote editing you can do as a team was just stronger. Um, so yeah, we, we learned Resolve. I took the, uh, what's his name? Sam Colder. I took his Da Vinci course, okay. which was yeah. really good. It was actually really good. It was very in-depth, uh, learned a ton. And then we built that like remote editing system using Google Drive, Carbon Copy Cloner, all that stuff. It was crazy, dude. Sorry, that was long, but it is crazy. No, 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 dude. That was so such cool context. And I love, man, I've got tons of questions even just off of that stuff because, well, I was curious about the Final Cut thing because I had always known that he had used Final Cut because he's always got his Matt Diavella B-roll and I'd always seen him editing on Final Cut. And I was like... Let's go, Matt. Get it, boy. What a what a G. What a G. Just like cutting in Final Cut. But then um, the other, because so when you guys switched to DaVinci, this was pre obviously all of the cloud stuff, right? So I guess, and I, I agree. Like when I was working with TMS, like even just bouncing DRP files was so much easier because it's like okay, it's a small file, and as long as everyone's got the footage, DaVinci's really good at linking up everything. Like even switching between editors, although not great, if you're organized, is like totally fine, right? Like that was that was kind of when you guys were doing this because the new cloud stuff is crazy, right? And that was all before this. We so I think we did this when there were there were some cloud features, but I don't think they were as fleshed out. And we were actually like in direct communication with Black Magic and they sent us like some of their cloud pods. Do you know what those are? Yes. Yes. Dude. I hated it so much. They were like, <laughs> dude, I hated them because like I like set it up, connected it to my like Ethernet with fiber and everything. And we just like could not edit in real time. It was just too slow because you're trying to like pull files off of a server. Um, that's why we ended up switching to carbon copy, which is like a little bit more like DIY setup, but it was just perfectly smooth. So there were some like cloud features in Resolve, but I think it's probably like better fleshed out now. So Donna and I were big cloud DaVinci adopters for that workflow. And like all of the back end of that was really great. But I agree with you, like cloud DaVinci has just some lag, even if you're using local files, because it's trying, I think, to sync the project file and just it's not as snappy. Um, and so, yeah, we kind of kind of went back and forth between that and just like 
we used um, Dropbox for a very similar kind of workflow of syncing our or syncing all of the files and uh, yeah, just having it local is just the best way to go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you just use the cloud as like your host for just all the files. You're not like actually editing off of a cloud because that would be that'd be so slow. But well, that's why I was so curious, right? Because Final Cut collaboration is literally the biggest pain in the ass. Really? <laughs> like, yeah. Like if I if I'm editing in Final Cut, I know for a fact that I am the only one touching it. Like, there's ways to to definitely like share it and do similar type stuff but it is man i just think it is so much more painful um and requires a lot more munging so like i i only use final cut if i'm like okay i am the sole god omnipotent editor and no one else is touching this <laughs> and that's where like the whole like editing nle wars like get kind of silly because it's like if it works for you and you can do it efficiently and professionally it's like that's fine it gets more into like you should switch to this one when we're talking about like collaborative stuff or like more high-end projects or whatever it's like then you got to consider working with a team that's dude editing with a team as you know is so much different than just like you shoot a youtube video and you edit it by yourself because you can just use cap cut for that you know oh it, it becomes crazy complicated well and uh who was the other editor you said spencer you need to have him on your show because he's a better editor better editor than me He's amazing. What did you guys split or how did you work? Were you guys working on different videos, the same video? What what, what was going on there? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, Matt would be like, dude, our process was pretty insane. So like Matt would have a script written and we would like take that script and he, oh, he would write a script and record voiceover for the script. We would take that voiceover file and edit it just into like, audio only and we would start putting like placeholders in there for like oh this b-roll shot could go here and we had an entire archive of matt's b-roll shots too um so we start building out like a rough timeline we would even start with music and some graphics and then he would be like filming footage at his place and uploading it and we would slowly build that together and i say slowly but like sometimes we would do it in like three or four days but so a lot of times I would do that, the big rough cut, like the story cut. So I'd take all the footage and build out this big thing. And then Spencer was amazing at like After Effects graphics. He didn't really use Fusion at the time, um, but he would do like any like cool graphics you see on Matt's channel. That was Spencer, freaking amazing. And he was so good at sound design, which was like our final pass. So a lot of times I would do like rough cut, story cut sometimes color grading a little bit of sound but he would do like all the effects and like the, the cool like shine on the end of it was spencer to be incredible at that is so much work i can totally like i've been there i feel that respect mad respect <laughs> especially for a channel like matt's where it's like every one of his videos is like masterful they're like borderline like mini youtube documentaries and so like getting it to his standard was such a great refinement of my skill because it took me from like crash zooming keyframes on premiere like in the first era of my channel to like wow i'm editing like mini documentaries for matt i gotta like up my game like crazy so matt would like come in at the final stage and just do like one final pass to make sure it was like his voice the way he wants it so sometimes he would like take entire things out or put something new in um so it was always kind of fun to see the final edit and be like, oh, cool, Like he kept that part, or he kept that funny bit, or that funny movie clip, or whatever. Um, so it was fun, dude. It was a process. It was, it was crazy. And, and again, like true testament to you guys and what you accomplished, because like being fully transparent, being a huge fan of what you did pre-Matt, I honestly was like so shocked at how like consistent his voice continued to be through the edit, because I was like, my boy, my, my dad, my future dad, Zach, Zachy, Zachy baby is like crushing the YouTube dorkiness, which I love. And then he's going to go work on a Matt video, you know, like it's like it could not be further from each other. <laughs> that brings up a lot of interesting thoughts and feelings and questions because it's like the the positive side of that is it made me so much better. Like I learned so many vital lessons and just like on the technical, like advanced level stuff too, like figuring out what is the best like audio levels for YouTube, like the, um, the normalization settings, like what, 
like I have all of that like dialed in now on my DaVinci Resolve settings, even like the color, making sure the grade is exactly the same on YouTube, which I learned from Dunna, by the way, his, he has a video on export settings. It's like the best one on YouTube, I think. I edited that video. Dude, yep. you're a beast. I I like have watched that multiple times just making sure I have my stuff right. Yeah, I remember when we got done with it, I had all of like my friends who were like so annoyed with DaVinci Resolve export color tweaks. And I was like, hey, just finish this. Go, go watch it. <laughs> it fixes all your problems. That's sick, man. But yeah, so like working for Matt gave me that like advanced level skill set. Um, even like I learned tips like you don't need music for the whole video. If you watch one of Matt's videos... It's it's cut into like A B formats where it's like it opens with an amazing hook that's like tons of B roll. It's straight up like documentary intro, and then it goes into an A roll segment of Matt talking, and the music will kick out. He'll start talking, and then it will go into B roll montages with music underneath. And it's that A roll B roll A roll B roll outro for the whole video, and it has an amazing flow and pace. Whereas before that, I was just like lo fi beat, make it ten minutes, uh, you're good. Like, it's like, dude, there's no, there's no rhythm. There's no flow. Like, so and another tip I learned from Matt was like, never put one B-roll clip by itself. Turn your B-roll into mini scenes that tell a mini story throughout your video. There's exceptions to the rule. For sure, exceptions to the rule. Um, but as a general rule of thumb, it's made my videos so much better because even when I'm talking about a camera, Let's say I'm like, okay, this Fuji X-T4 shoots, like, has a APS-C size sensor. I could show one shot of the sensor, or I could show me picking up the camera, taking off the cap, showing the sensor, letting it shine, setting it down, then go back to A-roll. So it's like, I made a mini story out of B-roll instead of just, like, two seconds of B-roll, and you're like, wait, what did I, what did I just see? No, it's so interesting you say that. I've, I've, never, I've never heard someone articulate that in a way that's so like that makes so much sense versus just kind of like feeling it subconsciously where the one the one shot is an interruption yes but then what you yes. said the, the the sequence is adding a story and we love stories ah oh, dude that is you just made it like bite size perfectly because yeah it's like you're see, you're watching somebody talk like you you look at their eyes that's what makes youtube unique you're connecting with them and then you see a shot and it goes right back to that and you're like wait why did he just show that thing like sometimes it makes sense but yeah like you said it's interruption versus like adding a story to it which is cool throw in a little extra story like people are people are dumber than you think but at the same time like we're all freaking geniuses right like they can handle that and it doesn't need to be just this like hey Here's the sensor, by the way. It's like, no, give give him a little more. I mean, I learned a lot from Spencer too, just working with another editor. Like, he's really good at sound design and taught me about like EQing music to not distract from the voice. So there's like a lot of times where I'll put an EQ on the entire music channel. I usually have two music channels, but I'll just scoop the mids down just a smidge because that's where your voice typically lands. Um, so that your music and your your voice aren't fighting. It's a simple concept, but like executing it is like it's simple but it's so effective just pull those mids down a little bit and you can really hear the voice shine a lot more so just little things like that for sure no that is that is a technique that you hear early on and go that can't be right because then you're taking away part of the song but then you go try it and you're like wait a second this was so simple and it actually makes the music sound so much better which is weird because i feel like i'm taking away from the music but then like there's still enough of it left that the blend it's crazy. It's crazy how good that technique is. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. If it goes yeah. into a B-roll montage, you could just crossfade it into like the full range of EQ again and like have the full sound of the song back. So yeah, just little things, man. I'm I'm trying to think of like specifics. If there's anything else, but I feel like those were the the big ones. Also, never releasing a video on the first cut, which I did so many times. <laughs> I was like, yeah, Matt, I've never done that. Trust me, dude. Like way more professional than that never done that <laughs> <laughs> you like go look at your past youtube video and it's like media offline in the middle of the video you're like ah it's fine it's part of the meme ah. people are talking about v13 final v13 <laughs> uploads I'm, I'm i'm v1 all day <laughs> v1 baby i don't even have a v it's just fine i don't do rough cuts man i do final cuts yeah i think that that was like all the positives of the matt experience for sure and then like we kind of mentioned earlier i guess maybe a negative maybe that's not the way to frame it but i just feel like i lost some of that dorkiness 
and I've been trying to find it. It's like, what's the right amount of dorkiness that I can put back into my videos without it being like forcefully done? You know, I'm in the same boat, right? Because I, and we can we can talk about this more for sure because you talked about like how polished. I mean, I think we can kind of blame like the Peter and Maddies of the world for having this just like insanely polished like our niche like just hyper focused on like this is like studio quality and i think that so many of us got wrapped up in that that we forgot like like there's still such a market right because i watch like fins are i watch um your videos i watch um curtis curtis's videos i feel like are the same way where it's like no like you can be professional i'm not saying don't do it but don't like don't feel like you have to like youtube's charm is the dorkiness do, like just from watching your channel in the past like couple of days like you do a really good job of like being yourself which is like where people are like attracted to that authenticity is like you're not like oh i'm gonna choose to be dorky dad guy like that you're just like being more of you and that takes time like you it takes a lot of like putting yourself in front of a camera which is so weird at first to just like oh i'm just gonna like be myself and film it and it works like it just takes time and repetition and i feel a lot of that same energy from you and, and you're right and that's yeah we, we can dive into that because i'm very curious like watching like the dr disrespect video which there's a million paths we can go down there but there was so much zach personality that i felt both in the edit and in just moments of your character that i was like yeah like i can tell he's he's thinking about it he's trying to He's, he's trying to get it back in there and he's, and I feel, I can feel it. And I am just like, I was like, I'm so locked in. I can't wait to like, see this. <laughs> yeah. Are we about to dive into this project? Cause this is like, this is current era for sure. I'm good with, that. I mean, again, if we need to circle back for other reasons, we can, but, but hit me with the Dr. Disrespect video. Cause it is, I hadn't watched it actually until we were going to do this call. And I was like, man, I am so glad. Like this video is incredible. <laughs> Dude, thank you, man. It was a, so I've been dreaming of this project since he announced his company. And so he like announced black steel bourbon. It's been a minute now. Like, I feel like it's been over a year. I don't know for sure. Hey, Indy, chill. <laughs> Sorry. My dog just freaked out. <laughs> so someone's like, like stealing my TV downstairs right now. We're just like talking casually. They're like <laughs> dog is trying to let you know. <laughs> like, you keep it down. So yeah, doc announces his new company, black steel bourbon. And I'm like, dude, it'd be really fun to like buy some. Cause I like bourbon. I love whiskey, just like sipping it, trying different kinds. And I was like, man, it'd be fun to like get that. And then I could make a, just like a commercial about it or something. Cause I've been wanting to kind of like flex my filmmaking muscles a little more and like get better at it. Cause I feel like, I've done so much of the dorky YouTube stuff that I, I kind of lost like that edge of like skilled filmmaking. Cause that's what I did full time for years before working for Matt. I was like DPing and camera operating on shoots. So I was like, okay, I'll just get this as a test and like make something. And then of course my YouTube brain is like, dude, what if we like take it one step further? Like what if like, could I get him to see this thing? Cause I'm, a, I'm a massive fan of what he does. He's so creative. I think he's in his forties too. And he's just killing it. I'm like, this guy is so cool. So it turned into that. So like this process of making this video was probably about like six to eight months. Cause I had to like order this whiskey. They couldn't ship it to Tennessee because of laws. So they shipped it to my parents' house in Nebraska. I had to fly there to get this freaking bottle of bourbon, come home with it and make this commercial. So like, the whole goal was like make a cinematic whiskey commercial, which I don't make commercials. So I was like, I'm, I'm not great at that. So I enlisted the help of some friends and, and wanted to get doc to see it. So I just documented the whole behind the scenes. The commercial was done. I mean, like I'm glancing over so many things cause it, it took so long to put this together. But then I, I got, I got him to see it on his stream. I sent him 300 bucks and, and a crafty message and he watched it live and, I made a YouTube short to promote it as well. And that just crossed 11 million views, which is so insanely crazy. Yeah, So many lessons have been learned from this project and so much encouragement because now I'm like wanting to turn this into a series, basically. Um, full, full transparency, like the BTS video is what I just loved, right? And like as the editing nerd, like... I mean, again, like editing encompasses so much, but the, the music selection, the comedy beats, and really just like the full narrative itself was was 
why was there why was there the whole time you know what like the teasing of him seeing it at the end right from like an editing perspective like that like that's the stuff i'm nerding out about that's the stuff i'm like just like yes he crushed this because the whole way through in a perfect world in my mind this feels so much like a mr beast video in that i'm constantly getting teased and yet for whatever reason it's checking every box of just being like so tasteful so much more chill yeah and i i just feel like you nailed that right and i think mm, that thanks, that man. type of style which is why i'm so stoked that you're thinking about making a series out of this because i think that that style is coming in i think it's coming in hot where as long as the narrative is there with the payoff because that's kind of like so youtube is hook journey payoff right like that is that is the recipe for success and i think that this format was perfect for that so uh, so i knew i wanted a commercial and i wanted a behind the scenes video but similar to you like i was more excited for the behind the scenes because i like that kind of stuff so i i had a guy that was filming behind the scenes the whole time obviously i didn't know how like beefy the behind the scenes video was going to turn into so like i got all the behind the scenes footage and edited like a very rough timeline just like all the good moments just like core story elements and I was like, okay, this is cool, but like for this thing to be like super good, like I have to get Doc to see this thing because that would be the ultimate closer to the video. Because honestly, like I like behind the scenes content, but a lot of it is just like, like it's like a DVD special, which is cool, but like you got to be a nerd about the project to be like, I want to watch the Lord of the Rings behind the scenes filmmaking stuff. You got to really want to watch that. But if I have like, this massive entertaining creator reacting to what I've done, like a lot more people are going to be interested in, in that. Well, and they were, I mean, the views show, right? Like it's, it's crushing because of that, that simple fact. <laughs> yeah. So you had rough cut the whole video even before you did the Dr. Disrespect hook part. So when it comes to like behind the scenes content, I'm definitely a fan of like, I'm going to edit the rough cut to see what this needs. What story can I build off of it? So like, rough cut. I was like, all right, got to get doc to see it. So I, I got doc to see it captured his reaction. So I'm like crap in my pants at this point. Cause I have the core, I have this insane outro. Uh, and that like the ending chapter of the video is like five minutes, um, of like getting him to see it. So I was like, so then I, I wrote and recorded a talking head that was just the glue to like get the whole thing together. So I wrote the hook that was kind of like Matt Diavella style where it's like showing like like behind the scenes elements, but like B-roll, like shots of Dr. Disrespect, and then the behind the scenes. And that behind the scenes chunk is so big, but I think it worked because like people were like, okay, there's gonna be a payoff. That's why I put the little like snippets of Doc like reacting to the the video. Cause it's like, if I didn't show any of that, people like wouldn't know. Cause I didn't want to put it in the title. Totally, a thousand percent. And again, like I, I'm a nerd, I'm with you. I love, I love BTS stuff. I mean, I watch, the Lord of the Rings behind the scenes and just eat that up, you know? But even as someone who loves that, watching this video, I felt it. I was like, I know, I know there is a big old carrot at the end of this video and I am so here for it, right? Cause, cause again, it's like, okay, like it's great to have BTS and I'm a nerd, which I think there's such an audience for that. Like Danny Gewurz has kind of built his whole channel around that philosophy, but then to, to take it that one step further, I was just like, oh, I could, the energy here is different. Cause I know, that we're going somewhere. Originally, the thumbnail I had designed, I had my friend Dave design a thumbnail for this and it had like Dr. Disrespect in it and it was way more like YouTube-y than I um, originally planned for, but it was really cool. It didn't like, but it didn't like really, I didn't think it was gonna work that well. So I actually ended up using like Danny Gewurz as inspiration because he's so good at like, he'll post his work, like a three minute video, like a commercial, and then the behind the scenes one the next week. And his behind the scenes videos have like the split thumbnails where it's like a production shot and then like a frame from the project. So I was like, I'm just going to just gonna go Danny vibe on this one and try it out. And it worked really well. Um, so yeah, a lot of inspiration from like him on this one as far as like structuring it as like an upload, like the project and then the behind the scenes. Also Ryan Cow, I don't know if you know who he is. Um, his behind the scenes content is amazing too. So like definitely pulled inspiration from him as well. Yeah. And I love watching both of their videos again for that reason where it's just like, yeah, this is just snacks the whole way through. I'm just snacking and I'm loving just the, the, you know, just, it's like, it's just great 
learning and like just it's just a good time but yeah i loved that yours had more and i think that it doesn't always happen that way you can't force it that way all the time but because you were able to find that story i was just like man i am so much more invested in this video than most of the other bts like i i'm snacking but i'm on the edge of my seat i love it <laughs> i learned so much from this project just in the past month which is why like i i'm not uploading again until i have like my next concept like finished which i'm filming it at the end of this month and i, I can say it here because for whoever watches this they're getting a little another little snack but the next one is for uh uh, Tim the Tatman. I don't know if you know who that is. I do. I do know who Tim is. Yeah, huge streamer. And I have an actor who's going to be portraying Tim, and he is a pretty well known comedian, actually. So it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be sick, dude. The It's happening at the end of January. So I'm freaking pumped. You guys getting the inside scoop here. I, I'm, I'm stoked. I can't wait to see that. But another like huge lesson I learned editing wise was like I made that YouTube short, which got insane views and for sure like boosted the two main videos um so i learned a good lesson that was like youtube shorts because <laughs> a lot of people were mad that i didn't include uh doc's full reaction in the short but there was just so much content to fit into one minute that i couldn't do it but me and my friends were talking about it and it's like the youtube short needs to be able to kind of live on its own while hinting toward like the big video and um ryan trahan's really good at making youtube shorts like this but it's like a really good hook and like showing its own like beginning middle and end but then also like leading the viewer to to watch the final video so like instead of me saying like full video on youtube which is which i what i usually do i wish i would have made it a little bit more of like a full story yeah. um but like teasing the video still but at the end of the day it's also like it totally worked <laughs> so yeah Totally. So I don't know. It's just one of those things where it's like whenever something, I, I mean, I just learned this because I've never gone viral before, but like whenever something goes viral, it's like that's when like the booty holes come out of the woodwork. They, they claw their way out of the dirt and they're like, they want to tear you down. So it's like something you just, you just got to deal with it. But the response was overwhelmed, like mostly positive, which was super fun. Well, then you just come on the Jake Felzine show and I pump your tires for an hour and four minutes so far. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> tell those tell those booty holes to skedaddle. <laughs> Screw off. Me and Jakey baby Jake's are Jake's in town. He's got his pump. <laughs> my butt cheeks are just getting super big. I'm like, dude, you put it in the wrong hole. It's not my tires, dude. Get out. Oh, that's so cool. That's kind of the plan like moving forward is like I'm going to really take my time in 2024 and focus on making less stuff but like making it all as good as I can. Not going full Mr. Beast mode because that's not me. But just like, I want to like make quality stuff, but still be a dork. So I'm going to figure that out this year, I guess. If you're making good stuff, like YouTube will, will show up when you need to, and people will show up when, when it, when it hits. And I think that that is just like so freeing as a creative person. And so. like finding that balance is really tough. Cause it's like, if you upload more consistently, you can start to get like sponsors to like pay you, which is very cool. But it's, it's hard to get those sponsors if you're a small channel. So it's like, you feel like you have to upload more. So that's the balance I'm trying to find is like, how the heck can I just like make enough money to just like survive me and my wife and our little baby that's coming soon. Again, I got all the dweebs in my life on this channel. So I, I would love to, I'd love to go NLE nerdy. And again, like I, for some context, like I, I'm so non NLE war proponent like that's kind of what i've built like a lot of my opinions on but that being said i'm like real big on trying to make sure people are using the right thing so i love talking about it right because it's like i'd rather try to educate people on like don't just hate because someone said you should like what are you actually doing and what what is what do you what, what needs to work for you right because like so for a little bit of context on me i started in final cut I'm a huge Final Cut simp. I love Final Cut to this day. I'm not going to say it's perfect. I hate so much about it, but I do love it. And um, just like anyone, kind of got bored with it and wanted to, you know, flex my brain and try something different. So I tried Resolve and, you know, here we are years later and now I love them both equally, which creates its own set of <laughs> challenges because I'm like, 
Well, now I've added a new decision into my workflow of which NLE should I use today because I love both of them. So I have to sit there and go, okay, what's good at this? What's good at this? What do I need? Whatever. But I love to have that conversation with people and especially you who's used all of the three big ones. I would just be curious, like, you know, what are you using? What is working for you and what is not working about like, I mean, you, you know, the first question of the whole interview was you wanted to kill Final Cut. You maybe swing back to Premiere and you love Da Vinci. So I guess let's let's dive in there. I'd love to, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So I, I started in Premiere Pro probably like 2015 ish. Um, and I, I was like diehard Premiere Pro fan. Like I would not fight people, but I'd be like aggressively against using another one because I'm like, dude, it's so sick. It's so snappy. And it just like slowly went downhill, like quality wise. And like, it was weird as I was getting nicer and nicer computers, like it was running worse and worse and like crashing. And like, dude, it was so strange. Cause like, I loved how like snappy it was. I don't know how to describe it other than snappy. Like, it's just so like, I feel like it's responsive. It does what I want when I want. I loved like how everything was laid out and like, I don't know. It just felt like very easy to see everything and work within it, but it started crashing so much. And I was like losing hours of work and just fuming. And I was like, I'm spending all of this money every year for something that's like clearly like Adobe doesn't give a crap about it. So, but I was one of those people that I was like, I'm going to stick it out. So the only reason I switched is because Matt asked us to switch to final cut. That was like, I was never going to switch. Um, but like now it's like for sure a blessing in disguise, like looking back. So, and I can't even like, I can't even accurately judge final cut. Cause I spent two weeks in it. I made one of my own YouTube videos in it and it was just really, really difficult for me to go from premiere to final cut. Just like understanding the magnetic timeline. I was like, if I want space between stuff, like where, where is it? Cause like I delete someone's like yoink. I'm like, what? No, go back over there. So like, yeah, I never it is, fully it grasped It is literally that. a completely different paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. But I can see why people like it. Like once you get so used to it, cause I've seen my buddy Dave edit in it. I'm like, I don't even know how you're doing what you're doing right now, but it's working for you. Just like even like splitting audio channels and dropping them down, stuff like that. I wasn't a huge fan of the color grading in Final Cut. It was just hard for me to grasp. Um, and I felt like, it was, it was probably like on par with Premiere Pros in my brain because I didn't think Premiere's was that great either. I always used like external plugins like um, Film Convert. I used that forever. Yep. So when I finally like was forced to switch to DaVinci by Mr. Diavella himself, um, that's when I was like, okay, I know I'm learning this for the long haul. So I'm just going to go full dive into it. And dude, the color grading alone, like I know that's what everyone says, but it's like, I feel like when I was editing in Premiere, my color grading was like duct taping stuff together. I was like, this kind of works here. That kind of works there. This will hold this together. And I just feel like in Resolve, I'm like, oh, I get like full control. I'm in the cockpit moving dials and switches. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. And it's so like more accurate and like, I don't know, just clean. Dude. I have had a hard time articulating that sentiment, but I agree with you. Where like in Final Cut, and I, I think Premiere is similar. Again, I haven't used it, but... Like if you're just going for like a generic, I mean, like I, you know, like even just like a YouTube look, like it, it gets the job done, but it feels almost like digital. Whereas in Final Cut or sorry, in Resolve, it's like I mean, you can do anything, anything. And it's not that hard because I remember when I started diving into it, I was like, how does this look so much more filmic? And it was not difficult. Whereas like in Final Cut, I would spend hours and still feel like it was kind of like crunchy and digital. Mm -hmm. And yeah, no, I totally agree with that. It's, it's, it's got so much juice. Everything that you need is built in. Like I don't use external stuff really. Like even think about like converting your footage from log to rec 709. Like it's just built in cause it's, it's built for that, which is so cool. And so yeah, you can like get the look you want with everything inside Resolve. The noise reduction is amazing. The optimization and playback is so much smoother than Premiere. And even like, imagine like going, I can't imagine going back to Premiere because it's like, how would I edit my audio now? Because like audio is so huge for me. And like Resolve is like this amazing like audio interface as well 
or like I can put all my music on one track and adjust that whole track at once, EQ it, whatever. Like I don't ever want to go back to trying to make audio sound good in Premiere because it's just duct tape, dude. Again, with our music backgrounds, when I open up Fairlight, I feel like I'm back in, you know, Pro Tools or just any of the big music editors. I just feel like I'm like, oh, my video's up there, so I kind of can still see it. It still exists, but I'm just like in there like, again, I'm at the cockpit. I can do all these effects. I can change levels so easy. I can add things to the whole track that just sounds perfect, and it's not hard. Like it looks daunting and then you get into it and you're like, wow, with just a few little, a little bit of tweaking, my audio sounds like a movie and it did not take that long to get there. <laughs> Speaking of that, did you be honest with me? Did you ever judge someone when they brought up using Adobe Audition? Because I have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like <laughs> it honestly like wasn't that much, but like if somebody was like, yeah, I just, yeah, I do my audio on Adobe Audition. I was like, cool, dude. And then I just like turn away and like fart a little bit as I walk away. Like, cool. Man. <laughs> going yeah. nice talking to you <laughs> no but even just like the fact that brings up the point of like everything you need is built into resolve as like one app instead of like using after effects audition all that stuff and paying separately for all that it's like you pay what is it four hundred dollars one time forever that, that alone, i think it's only three i think it's only three hundred it's only three hundred yeah you're probably right it's crazy one time even like and then it comes down to like you spend all of your time at Premiere editing this video, getting it to look and sound how you want. And then you export it and the colors are off because you didn't put your gamma compensation LUT as an adjustment layer over the whole project. I'm like, oh my gosh, dude. So I'm done with it, brother. I'm I'm out. See you, Adobe. I feel I, I don't know what they would have to do. And I think about that so much again, because I've never touched it, but I'm so in the community that I feel pretty <laughs> pretty in the know and i don't know what they would have to do to like course correct at this point because they're more expensive and they're worse so like what what's it gonna take to, to turn the ship don't buy that <laughs> right yeah i mean worse it's like, I, like I feel like da vinci would have to go subscription and then it might be a battle to the bottom there but i just i don't i don't know i i'm i'm really nervous that Resolve will do that, but I still have very high hopes that they won't because of their other business, right? Like I think the whole black magic umbrella allows them to do it and works. And like they gotta they gotta keep that energy or they're gonna betray us all. I mean, exactly. Like if they did that, they would betray us all because their whole thing is like affordable filmmaking tools, but all of the quality, you know? It's like if they went subscription, dude, that would suck. But yeah, I think if Premiere wanted to like take back a lot of customers, I feel like they would have to do this complete overhaul and like this make a lot of like marketing noise about it and be like, we took the code of R Premiere and like burned it down and built up this new like rising phoenix of Premiere Pro from the ashes. It's like it's faster than Resolve, all this stuff. But even then, it's like, what would they add to it? That would make it better. Like maybe they would do something that would be like Premiere and After Effects, After Effects combined into one program, and they're both like baller. That would maybe be the way to do it, but I don't know. Yeah, if you could get the After Effects crew in there, that could have a chance. But that's the thing is like really the only Premiere feature that I'm aware of that I'm on, that I'm jealous of to this day is AutoPod, right? Where it does the auto like which I didn't used to give a crap about, and then I started doing this show, and now I'm like that would be kind of nice. Yeah, and I just I guarantee Resolve will have that. Like, they'll have that. They're gonna add that. There's no way that they're not working on that. And then like I I can't think of any other features that they haven't gotten parity with. Probably some After Effects stuff with Fusion, but like that keeps improving too. And like you can do so much in Fusion. Fusion's insane. Like I have spent so many hours trying to learn it and I still don't know crap. <laughs> I know like nothing about Fusion. I need to get into it more. But did you have a hard time learning node based color grading? Yeah. And Fusion is the same way. Both of those were pretty mind-bending. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of that, right? I mean, and I, and I was coming from Magnetic, right? Like, I had not done track-based editing, so going to track-based editing was steep. I, was gonna, I, I <laughs> bet it would have been, like, so hard for you if you didn't have a music background, too, because, like, you probably, like, in GarageBand, at least you were aware of, like, what a track is, you know? like Yes. 
thankfully you had that music background. Yeah. The thing that's always been hard for me, because so in music, right, music is very mathematical in that it's very, it's like a grid, right? Like it's beats. And when I'm making new tracks and putting in new stuff, a lot of times on those beats, it's very snappy. It's like Tetris, right? So like when I make music, it feels normal. The thing that I struggle with with editing is that there's so many times where stuff bleeds on top of each other in a non-mathy way, right? There's no beats. It's like, oh, this riser comes in, but it's not it's not to a BPM. It just comes in and hits at a certain point. And what I love about Final Cut is that stuff hitting on top of each other, you don't even have to think about because it just moves it out of the way automatically. And I, the thing that I've never, like now that I've spent so much time in Resolve, I'm there and I know how to fix those problems and I'm, and I'm, and I'm thinking of it. So I don't do it nearly as much as I used to, but I used to just overwrite stuff all the time. And then I'd be like, oh shit, where did that go? Like I lost There's, it. That's like probably on the top five things is like most depressing when you're editing. If you overwrite a section of a video because you like collapsed it, it's like, dude. But yeah, that was one of the coolest things about Final Cut is like when the magnetic timeline would snap the the rear end to the front and like the other stuff would just go like bloop on top, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Genius. Why can't all of them do that? The design language is if you want to overwrite something, you have to hit another button. You have to click, yes, I actually do want to overwrite this. Because otherwise it's like, no, it's always going to be there and it, it's going to stick stuff on top of each other and you're going to have to go fix it, but at least you didn't lose it. <laughs> yeah. How do you describe a magnetic timeline to somebody who's never used it before? Honestly, the, the th I always tell people, which isn't super helpful for our generation, but I think it is the digital version of actually splicing film. Okay. You are literally gluing stuff together and it's that same ideation that if I want to put something in between, well then whatever I glued in between moves the stuff to the end, right? So you think about it like that and then it still has all of the additional juice to still have kind of tracks in nature, right? It's, I mean, in my opinion, it is physical filmmaking into the digital world. And I think that it's, I think it's phenomenal. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well there, I mean, that's cool. Cause you were saying like you use final cut for some things and resolve for others. So you found like a perfect use case to just use final cut, which is cool. Especially if you're like a working editor, like it's probably good to be versed in all three of them because they're they're still all popular. This is about something I truly love. So now I can't shut up and neither can like the people I keep talking to are in the same boat where they're like, wow, I can't shut up either. And I'm like, I know we all love this shit. <laughs> when you recharge, like personally, are, do you just have to like totally veg by yourself? How do you recharge? I mean, right now it's like, yeah, I come out to my office and work on YouTube stuff, right? Or do whatever. Like, I just like, just kind of having like peace and quiet to fiddle, edit, whatever, like that, that recharges my batteries for sure. So seems like every creative person has like their method of recharging. So that's cool. All right, Zach. Well, I think we better cut it off there, dude. This has been <laughs> amazing. <laughs> we, I seriously feel like we could have gone for an infinite amount of time with how much fun this has been. So thanks for coming on the show today. And as always, I want to make sure to give you a chance to let people know where they can find you on the internet. Sick. Dude, thanks for having me on. It's fun to just like nerd out. It's so fun when someone speaks your language. It's like, I feel so seen and heard. Um, if you want to check out my stuff, it's uh, Zach Mayfield on YouTube and Instagram. I'm going to be trying to make some, some good stuff this year, some entertaining stuff and some filmmaking stuff. So come join yes. me on the so, YouTube journey. So eager and on the edge of our seats. That's amazing. All right. Well, hey man, you have a good one again. Thank you so much. And I will see you guys in the next one. All right. Thanks. Love you, mom.